All right, hello everyone. By my clock, it's 10 o'clock Arizona. So good morning, good afternoon, good evening, depending on where you're coming from. Um, my name is Chantal Ward, two co-directors of Circle, uh, and I'm here today with uh, Kate Mackay, who's our associate director, and Sochila Coronado Vargas, who's our outreach coordinator, um, and we'll be guiding you through this talk um, with this set of speakers that we're very excited to bring you today. We'll be talking with us about expanding L2 learning, teaching multimodal composition through socio-scientific topics. Um, so before we turn to the speakers, I just have a couple of announcements. Now, many of you are returning, but some of you, this might be the first event you've uh, attended with us. Um, so if you don't know us already, CIRCLE is the Center for Educational Resources in Culture, Language, and Literacy. Um, we're based in Tucson and the College of Humanities at the University of Arizona, um, but we're one of 16 language resource centers, all supported by the Department of Education. Uh, so if you are new to us, we encourage you to check out our website. We have a number of resources, other professional development events, and all of the other centers also um, collaborate with us, and we offer different kinds of materials to support language educators and language education. So uh, make sure you check us out. We also have a couple of upcoming events that we want to highlight. Uh, this is the first of our summer virtual webinar series, uh, but we do have two other events. So coming up on June 12th, we have Soaring Higher with Macaws, integrating IDDL with other web applications to enhance language learning. So this will introduce you to using Corpus tools, specifically those associated with um, the Macaws project, um, which, it, which uh, is a database basically of student writing and of student writing prompts. Um, so we encourage you to also join us for that. And then we have part two of uh, basically the webinar you're going to see today, which will be another webinar on socio-scientific issues in language classrooms. And then also upcoming later this month, we have uh, the new deadline proposals for our next biennial intercultural competence conference. Um, so that'll be coming up actually in January, but the proposals are due June 21st. And um, we have a really exciting set of plenary speakers um, and hope to have many of you also out as presenters. And now to today's webinar, Expanding L2 Learning, Teaching Multimodal Composition Through Socioscientific Topics. Um, we have a wonderful panel of presenters today, so I'm going to introduce each um, only very briefly so that we make sure they have plenty of time to speak. Um, the first is Jill Kastik. She's one of the project's directors, and she's an associate professor in the Department of Teaching, Learning, and Sociocultural Studies at the University of Arizona. Her research addresses the intersection of literacy and technology, and it examines the development of literate capacities, including multiliteracies, technology-enhanced language learning, um, and STEM learning, and how these intersect. Uh, then Rachel Floyd is a graduate student in the Second Language Acquisition and Teaching Interdisciplinary Graduate Program at the University of Arizona. She earned her master's in French and her Bachelor of Arts in French and Psychology from the University of Tennessee before coming here to us in Arizona. And her research interests include multiliteracies, technology-enhanced language learning, and the professional learning of language instructors. Emily Helmick, another of the project directors, is an assistant professor of French and second language acquisition and teaching at the University of Arizona. And her work focuses on the impact of global digital um, uh, technologies on language education. And her research has appeared in a variety of different publications. Um, and she's also interested in perceptions of technology um, by students, instructors, um, and also others um, such as family members. Uh, then Austin Morris is a French instructor here in Tucson, Arizona. He has an MA in French from the University of Arizona and has 10 years of experience teaching French, English, ESL, and history. Uh, Blaine Smith, another of the project directors, uh, is a professor in the Department of Teaching, Learning, and Sociocultural Studies at the University of Arizona. And her research focuses on multimodal composing processes of culturally and linguistically diverse adolescents and teacher integrations of technology. Uh, then finally, last but not least, Wen, Wen is a graduate student in the Department of Teaching, Learning, and Sociocultural Studies at the University of Arizona. Wen Wen obtained her MA from the University of Arizona majoring in language reading and culture, uh, and Wen is a doctoral student focusing on digital literacies, multimodality, and technology-enhanced teaching and learning. And you can um, hear the different kinds of expertise and different perspectives um, just in these brief introductions. And I'm now going to turn the floor over to our presenters. All right. Thank you so much, Antel, for that lovely introduction. And thank you so much to Circle for, for their support of, of this project. And thank you all for joining us today. We're, we're delighted to uh, we're delighted to be here uh, to be here with you. 
We'll divide our time today into four main parts. Uh, each of these sections will include time to interact and to reflect on your own practice and teaching and learning contexts. We'll wrap up at the end with some time for questions. Before we get to these main sections, though, we want to provide some contextualizing information on our project as well as on the resources we've created to document that project. I'll start first with a little on the structure of the collaboration that really is at the heart of, of what we'll be talking about today. Our research team joined forces with Austin uh, in one of his classes of intermediate level French learners. As you'll hear from Austin in a moment, our collaboration um, addressed specific needs and objectives uh, that he had in his own classroom. Our approach was to address these objectives through multimodal composing grounded in socio-scientific issues. We collaborated across an academic school year and we created different kinds of projects, short day-long projects, uh, all the way up to projects that spanned a few weeks. Throughout our collaboration, we built in opportunities to reflect and to respond to student experiences and perspectives, listening to student reflections and opinions and making adjustments accordingly. What we'll be sharing today is based on that collaboration, what went well, uh, what didn't go well, uh, and most of all, what we learned about integrating multimodal composing based on socio-scientific issues in the L2 classroom. So this project really became possible with the collaboration and expertise of Austin. Uh, so I'm gonna turn it over to him to uh, talk a little bit of it about his experiences with this project. Hi, everybody. Um, so I'm just going to talk for a second about, like Emily said, just what was my experience with the project in my classroom. So it was a full year um, experience. Um, this is my first year, my ninth year of total teaching. Um, so I was still being introduced to the school culture. It was really high expectations for students. Um, I think 99% of the students uh, go to a four-year university. Um, I had just graduated from UA the previous year and had experience in constructing curriculum with these ideas in mind. Um, and executing them at a beginner level French, so French 101, 102, and uh, 202. That's the first, second, and fourth semester uh, French. Um, however, this is my first try at executing it in the, in the high school classroom with my students. Um, the students were generally expecting um, a drill activity teaching style. Uh, in fact, some had come to the classroom with five to six years of experience of French. Um, and almost all of it in, in that style. Um, so they had a heavy expectations on me, on the classroom to look that way. Um, you know, things like memorizing grammar rules, applying this to fill in the blank questions out of a textbook and repeat, et cetera. Um, this wasn't the style of all of the teachers at the high school that I taught at, uh, I, nor was it the expectation from administration. However, the students regardless came in um, with this expectation uh, that class, that language classrooms looked a certain way. Um, and so it was going to be a bit different. Um, with my previous experience at U of A, and having also taught English previously, I wanted to make their learning more text-based and also more product-based. Uh, I wanted them to carry out French into other avenues. Uh, so they, I really wanted them to see the access points in using a language and contextualized products. Uh, in short, I wanted them to see how they could use it in meaningful ways outside of, you know, the general fill in the blank uh, textbook, multiple choice, et cetera, which is really what they were used to and what they were expecting. Um, since the project has finished, uh, the students have moved on to upper level courses and, you know, and not taking French anymore as well, some of them. And uh, graduation was just a week ago. So the majority of the students that were in that class were juniors. And so they're graduating just a week ago now. Um, and I've been able to catch up with most of them since. And many found the experience to be like a really important touchstone uh, for their language learning, specifically in French. So one example would be a, a one student uh, while chaperoning prom, she left the prom dance floor uh, to chat with me about the TikTok that they made um, in the back of the classroom. Um, and another about the, the comic strip that they made. Uh, this is the same prom, so they're leaving the dance floor to come and ask me um, about these products that they made in a class, uh, or in, in the class that the project uh, in collaboration with the project. 
Um, another student uh, who was in French club, she was the president of French club, uh, she would constantly ask me why the brothers in this story that we read were so mean to their mother who didn't understand technology. And she would constantly ask me questions about, well, why was it like this? And why, was, why were they so mean to her? Um, just to say that in the end, the products that they made and the reading that they did, texts that they used, um, were valuable to them. And for me as a teacher, most importantly, they were memorable, um, which is heartening for me as a teacher because you want them to carry on their learning, whether it's in French or whether it's other avenues, but that they carry it to other spaces. Um, and I, so I think the, the ability to uh, remember these uh, is important. So they didn't, on the other hand, ask me about the textbook activity from page 250 um, that they did um, about, you know, um, the Passé Composé, but instead they like to talk to me about these products that they made um, and these people that came into the classroom uh, for a full year and wanted to chat with me about that. Um, and so to me as a teacher, it was important that they had these essential touchstones um, that were important for their French progression and that they still have a chance to talk about. Thanks, Austin. Thank you so much for that. And I will pass it back to Wen, who's going to talk a little bit about some of the supplementary materials that we have available for you. Okay, thank you, Emily. Um, this webinar is not only a source of information about the project. So we have a companion website that has archived the resources from our collaborative work with Austin, the language instructor. And you will have time later in the webinar to explore the website on your own, but we wanted to go over its major features here. So website is the archives of this webinar and other resources in the materials of this research project. On the uh, right top, you can see five tabs which direct you to different web pages with different resources. On what's happening, you can find links to the various activities we will do today, as well as eventually a recording of our session today. So if you go to that curriculum category, that includes three subcategories, uh, sub which are uni themes, student project examples, and the language objectives that associate with ad for standards. Unit themes include four unit topics that students multimodal composing anchored. In each of the units, you can learn how multimodal composing activities were designed, organized, and implemented in the classrooms. And you can also see students' work examples in language objectives that align with ad for standards. Uh, under that instructional strategic category, we distilled some principles to guide language teachers if they want to implement multimodal composing projects in the classrooms. These strategies encompass how teachers scaffold projects, how teachers develop digital literacies through use of technology for meaning making, and how to select socioscientific topics that are related to teaching content. Last but not least, we provide additional uh, resources which might be useful for language teachers to understand multimodality, technological tools, and language teaching and learning. On this web page, you can see some literature which is about multimodal composing and second language learning. You can also find some digital tools that can be used uh, in doing multimodal projects like Adobe Spark, VoiceThread, ThingLink. All in all, multimodal composing is not about how to use digital tool. Instead, it's about how students make meaning and practice their language through use of tools. So if you have any further questions about the website or materials, uh, please feel free to email us. Thank you. I will pass to Dr. Smith to introduce the concept of multimodality. Thank you, Wen. We thought it would be helpful to start off by defining multimodality and some key concepts, and then review some of the main research findings in the field of multimodal composing. So what is multimodality? Crescent Van Leeuwen define it as the use of several semiotic modes in communication. 
And semiotic modes are socially shaped resources for making meaning that encompass a variety of elements, including but not limited to text, speech, visuals, sound, movement, gesture, and gaze. As many of you already know, multimodal composing includes a wide variety of projects, and some of the most popular that are integrated in classrooms include videos, blogs and websites, multimodal presentations and video games, and comics and podcasts. And of course, there are many more types of multimodal projects that teachers design. One key concept with multimodal composing is understanding how it's a complex process that involves the interaction of multiple modes. As Jewett explains, composers orchestrate meaning through their selection and configuration of modes. The message, the meaning in any mode is often interwoven with the meanings made with those of all other modes co-present and co-operating. So emphasis here is really placed on understanding the new and synergistic meaning created when layering modes. Another key concept involves the process of transmediation, which occurs when students translate meaning from one mode to another. And this is really a generative process that involves innovation and reflective thinking on the part of the composer as they transform meaning across modes. Finally, when thinking about L2 learning, it's important to understand how translanguaging is fundamental to multimodal composing. As individuals draw on semiotic resources coded in verbal language, gesture, written text, and in other modes to achieve communicative ends. So why does multimodality matter? There are a few key reasons. The first is that there's been a call for an expanded view of literacy and communication that requires for students to be skillful consumers and producers of digital texts. And this view connects with the actual communication standards. Second, multimodal communication aligns with universal design for learning principles, including the importance of offering students multiple means of representation, engagement, and expression. Additionally, research shows that a growing majority of adolescents create and share multimodal content online. And as a result, there's often dramatic disconnects between in-school and out-of-school compositional practices. Some scholars contend that the primary print-centric learning environment offered in schools often do not match students' learning needs, which involves new and different ways of thinking. And lastly, and perhaps most importantly, a growing majority of research suggests that integrating multimodal projects offers culturally and linguistically diverse students multiple points of entry to communicate in empowering ways that promote equity. Colleagues and I recently conducted a systematic literature review that focused on research studies examining L2 learning and multimodal composing in schools. We analyzed 70 studies in secondary classrooms and found five main themes across the research. The most prominent theme was that multimodal composing fostered student agency and identity expression. A lot of times through these digital projects, students infused aspects of their bilingual and bicultural identities. The second theme was that integrating digital projects often reshaped classroom spaces and allowed for students to connect to their communities and out of school interests. Students also composed for audiences outside the classroom. Students also often developed as multimodal designers through these projects, including learning how to effectively use a variety of digital tools and modes for different purposes. The fourth theme was that there were new opportunities for students to expand their linguistic repertoires through the multimodal composing process. And finally, recent research has begun to examine the potential for multiple modes serving as valuable tools for thinking to support content learning and language learning. We'd now like to pause to have you consider some of the applications for your own classroom. So please think over your existing assignments, which assignments might you be able to remix so that into a digital format that involves multiple modes of expression. And we'd like for you to capture your thinking in a Padlet, which you can access in a couple ways. There's a link in the chat and there's also one on our website. And so we'll just spend a few minutes with you brainstorming in, in Padlet, and then we'll come back together to synthesize ideas across your multimodal remixes. So go ahead and move over to Padlet. Yeah, so just take a, a couple minutes to think about your multimodal remix and share some ideas. Wow, this was really exciting to read. Um, 
you all are creating some very uh, engaging and innovative multimodal projects in your classrooms. I saw such a variety of digital projects from videos, infographics, photography, comics, social media, animations, multimodal presentations, and that's just the ones I was able to read. And a couple of things that I found that were interesting are a lot of you are already thinking about connecting or connecting to socio-scientific issues. Um, I saw one looking at the water cycle and some other issues. And I also found it interesting how uh, many of you talked about um, how really any project or essay can be remixed and made multimodal and that the emphasis should be more on the meaning making and the ideas um, rather than a written format. So this was really exciting to read. Thank you so, thank you for sharing all of you. So and just a reminder as well, we will um, have these Padlets will be available on the website. So if you'd like to go back and, and be inspired by uh, your co-attendees um, brainstorming, that will be available to you as, as a resource. So uh, we'll move on to the, sec the second section of the webinar uh, where we'll talk about some of the specific projects that we designed to combine multimodal composing and socio-scientific issues. We'll also give you some, some more time to explore on your own the project materials on the website, how they're organized, uh, as well as how they're displayed. We'll also give you some time to reflect on how you might design a multimodal composing project for your own classroom and teaching context. So the first project that we'll talk about is the, the first project that we did in, in our collaboration. And for this project, we asked students to create Instagram posts as characters from a short story that they had read as a way to reflect on the role of modern technology. So you have here some examples of some of the posts that students created uh, to um, as characters from the story that they had read. We had several objectives in this first project. Um, this was our first project, so uh, an important piece of this was really to introduce students to digitally mediated projects and to multimodality. Uh, we also, going back to what Austin said earlier, we wanted to engage students in meaningful language production, right? This was one of the, the key goals of, of our time uh, in, in the classroom, and so wanting to get students to be meaningfully uh, engaging with language production. And finally, we wanted to encourage students in this first project to reflect and to understand really the, the core of multimodality. So that meaning is conveyed using multiple modes. Before we talk about uh, the specific socioscientific issue that we used for this project, I wanna talk a little bit about this term socioscientific, right? We've been talking about this since the beginning. Um, maybe it's time to put a little definition into this concept. So, Socioscientific issues are issues that are complex, uh, controversial, uh, but also very socially relevant today. They do involve a science component, but more than that, they involve a social or an ethical component. So some examples of socioscientific issues are climate change, industrial farming, cell research, captive breeding, things like that. So why do we advocate using these types of issues in the language classroom and at the center of uh, these multimodal composing projects? Language, as you all know, uh, is a communicative act and it requires uh, meaty content. So these socio-scientific issues really give students a lot of opportunity for meaningful communication, uh, opportunities to express their opinions using multiple resources, including the target language. So for this first project, coming back to this first project, um, the, the socio-scientific issue that we tackled was the role and influence of technology on our daily lives. We created this project as a, a quick project, a, a potentially even day-long project that would be easily integratable into any kind of, uh, of unit that you're doing with any kind of text uh, that might be already involved in that unit. Uh, we estimated approximately one class session. So here's an excerpt uh, from the student assignment sheet, what we gave to students. And we basically asked students to create an Instagram post that uh, had a profile name and a picture, a, a main post, as well as some direction on what we wanted in the captions. Important to have hashtags when, when working with Instagram. 
A very important layer of, of this project was a showcase, asking students to share their posts with the whole class. You have a, an image here of Rachel, who was leading that discussion, um, that, that showcase uh, in our collaboration. So we asked students to post all of their, um, their Instagram posts to a collaborative Google slide deck, and then we presented all those posts to the class. A final component uh, of the project was a reflection. So we asked students to prepare uh, this written reflection in English before the showcase. And then we use the questions that you have here on the screen as the basis of a group discussion in English. Uh, the goal here was really to drive home how the different modes that they had selected uh, were contributing to the overall meaning that they were creating. The reflections were very rich. Uh, you have an excerpt here from one of the reflections that a student wrote for this project, and I'll give you a, a moment to, to read that uh, excerpt. So some really, you know, some really deep thinking uh, that that's going on in um, in this reflective essay. So the major tools that we used here um, were an Instagram template and Google Slides. So we, we opted to use an Instagram-like platform, to, to use a template rather than Instagram itself. Uh, so we were simulating a lot of ways in, in Instagram. And this ensured that all students could participate regardless of whether or not they had an Instagram account or if they had a cell phone in class. Um, and this slide here is the, the template that we used actually, um, and it's available for download on the website. There would be a lot of other options for this project, though. You could think about another social media or tech-based genre, you know, Facebook template, for example, even a TikTok template. Uh, and you could use uh, many different kinds of platforms to present the student work, things like PowerPoint, for example. So the second project that we would like to showcase uh, was lengthier. Um, and it focused on the influence of technology, again, but this time on the future of work. And we asked students uh, in pairs to create a digital story to illustrate a day in the life of a worker in 2070. So we're going to, I'm gonna play a, an example uh, of one of these videos uh, from this second project. Oops. L'année est 2070. Voici Emma. Elle se réveille pour endurer un autre long journée au travail. Bon matin, Emma. Elle commence sa journée en sortant de son lit et elle marche vers son placard pour choisir sa tenue. Ici, elle se change pour la journée. Pouf! C'est parfait! Après, elle est prête à partir au travail. Elle utilise ses forces pour se téléporter au travail. Bonjour, madame. Vos patients vous attendent. Dans la salle d'attente. Merci, Sally. Je suis prête pour voir Robo Miltois. Depuis des années, la population de robots grandit et ils commencent à remplacer les salariés dans des positions industrielles. Les robots sont maintenant capables de vivre indépendamment et ils sont devenus un nouveau groupe dans notre société. Mais, le problème qui résulte de cette autonomie. Les all right, so that's just a little taste of, of one of these videos. I wish we, we could play all of them for you. Um, but you see, you get a sense of, of what students uh, did with this digital story, how they were thinking through how work might look uh, in uh, the next 50 years. So our goals uh, in developing this project were, were several, of course. Um, important in, in terms of difference with the first project is we wanted students to practice and apply vocabulary, grammar, and concepts that they had learned in a textbook unit that was focused on work and workplace. So we extended one of the textbook units in this class. Uh, we also wanted them to use multiple modes um, to look at uh, linguistic modes, of course, but also non-linguistic modes in, in using those to express their opinions on complex topics and also to develop digital literacy skills. The socio-scientific topic, uh, as I mentioned, was this the impact of technology uh, on our lives, but most specifically uh, in the future, this futurist lens of how might technology impact our work lives uh, in the future. 
I also mentioned that this was a, a longer session. We, we planned this project to, to span over uh, several class sessions. Uh, in fact, we approximate approximately six class sessions, but that could certainly uh, vary depending on how much time you would want to dedicate to in-class time versus out-of-class time. We set up uh, a few parameters for the students to work within, uh, and you can see the, the entirety of this again on the website. Uh, we gave them a time length of a video to produce uh, a number of modes, as well as what kind of language we were looking to see, what kind of written text, what kind of spoken text. And in addition uh, to the, the digital story itself, we again asked for this reflective component in English. Um, for this one, we asked students to just write, uh, to, to, to write their reflection with the questions that you see here. We gave the students with, uh, in this project a lot of options in terms of the tools that they could use for the project. We presented and provided support for three primary tools, Pixton, which is a comic maker, which uh, is, is the platform that was used to create the digital story that you saw, uh, VoiceThread, as well as Be Funky, which is a collage maker. But we also left it open to students um, if they wanted to experiment with another tool or if they were more comfortable with a tool that they had already used, we were very open to the different ideas that they wanted to um, that they wanted to bring to the table. There uh, are also a lot of other options, though. You can, you know, this is a really flexible project. You could use things like Book Creator, PlayPosit, um, PowerPoint. Uh, so really, uh, a lot of options here. So we created uh, two other projects as a part of this collaboration. Uh, but rather than walking through them individually. Uh, what we thought we'd do is give you the opportunity to explore the website resources. So the information, the detailed information that we have on these different projects yourselves. Um, so we'll do uh, an activity here in, in two parts. Uh, the first part is uh, giving you some time to explore, uh, explore the website. Um, you can dive in as much as you'd like, um, looking at examples, the assignment sheets, the templates, you could go back to projects one and two if you'd like. And we're thinking about five minutes for that. And then for the second part, we'll go back to a collaborative Padlet um, and ask you to reflect on how you might use some of these resources in your own classroom context. Feel free to adapt these as much as you'd like. Um, the Padlet is, uh, the new Padlet is, I'm gonna copy paste that into the chat right now. Uh, you can access it that way or you can again access it via the website um, i'll let you know when five minutes have passed uh, and when you might want to start thinking about moving over to the padlet um, but really this is time for you to to explore and to think about how um, you might engage with um, with these resources in your own context Great, you know, it's, it's really great to see how some of these uh, different resources might be connecting with, with you and with your classrooms. Uh, I see, you know, some of specific tools, you know, like VoiceThread um, being something that might be uh, of interest, uh, as well as, you know, already looking at how some of these socio-scientific issues might be integrated into courses, into, into getting at uh, culture or, or what's going on, uh, current events in different countries, uh, Germany, for example. Um, uh, a couple of you noted the, the collaborative multimodal vocab list, so some of the specific templates. So uh, there's really a lot going on on the website, and so I encourage you to continue uh, looking to see uh, what might be useful um, to, to your own classroom context as you design uh, instruction uh, uh, moving forward. So I am going to pass it off uh, to Wen to lead us into the next section. Okay, thank you, Emily. Um, in this section, I'm going to present instruction implementation in the classroom. Uh, in this project, besides language learning purpose, uh, three major aspects were considered in implementing instructions. These are multimodality, digital literacies, and the socio-scientific issues. In our experience, it's helpful to introduce and integrate multimodal compositions gradually into the L2 classroom, especially for students who have not encountered this kind of learning activity in their L2 classrooms before. We suggest beginning with a few short-term projects and building up to longer projects as the semester goes 
goes on, which is a supportive way to encourage multimodal meaning making. Connecting with multimodality is a process of examining multiple examples of the ways learners engage with meaning and ideas in multiple forms. Uh, since most of all the ways we interact in the digital world integrates aspects of multimodality. Uh, we recommend helping students understand multimodality and uh, bring in examples from popular culture and unpack them together. Explaining how multimodality can help students communicate their message more clearly through highlighting common everyday instances of multimodality, such as emojis in text message, nonverbal communication in an in-person conversation. Uh, another strategy to teach multimodality is to create opportunities for discussions that deconstruct multimodal project to discover and better understand how different modes work together to enhance a message. Language teachers are also recommended to explicitly talk to students about why multimodal projects are beneficial to their learning, especially for students who are used to other different types of learning activities, such as sentence drills. We also highly recommend incorporating some kinds of reflection activity in your multimodal projects. This is a great way to solidify learning and to get student feedback. Language teachers don't have to rely on written reflections. The oral reflection is also an option. Um, like this Flipgrid is a platform to support oral reflection and uh, this two excerpts from uh, language teachers and uh, his um, reflection prompts that provide to the students. Um, teachers can also integrate reflections into group discussions, peer work, etc. About developing a student's digital literacies, technology brings us new ways of reading, writing, communication, collaboration, and meaning making. Some tools like storyboards and graphic organizers allow students to organize ideas and thinking. Uh, Google Docs allow students to work collaboratively and share perspectives. Language teachers need to help students to clarify learning objectives and content which drive to the tool choice and use. Uh, we suggest starting with a limited set of technological tools that can be carefully and thoroughly explained to students. And then to bring back or reuse these tools in the future digital projects, so students don't have to relearn how to use them. Teachers can always allow students to choose and explore additional tools, but having a small set that are uh, fully supported in the classroom will reduce uncertainty about new tools. Um, teachers need to keep in mind that not all the students are tech savvy, especially using technology in an academic context. So we cannot emphasize enough the importance of proper guidance in the training for students on the tools you select. Collaboration is also an important aspect in developing digital literacies. We suggest adding in opportunities for peer-to-peer -peer collaboration. This process helps students to refine their ideas and build out their intended audience. Through collaboration, students communicate and negotiate the ideas to achieve a common goal. These kind of peer-to-peer -peer interactions are also helpful for technology use. Work time or collaborative uh, projects can be a great way to support students in the use of uh, tech, uh, technological tools and uh, troubleshoot issues with the technology. Regarding the social scientific issues, there are a lot of potential uh, topics to choose from. From our research, we found that selecting socioscientific topics that aligned with student interests 
or that directly affect the local community fostered more buy-in from students. Uh, we also found that good inspiration for what topics to choose came from the course materials, textbooks, or other materials that were already a part of the class curriculum. For example, we built out second project on the future of work was based on the existing unit on the workplace. And the third project on genetic modification was linked to the unit on love and friendship. So there doesn't have to be a specific unit in your curriculum on a particular socioscientific issue in order to integrate these topics and the projects into your classroom. It might require language teachers to think and design creatively based on the specific context. So we also have an application activity which asks you to put your thoughts of these two questions on the Padlet. These two questions ask you how might you incorporate reflection in your current teaching context and what social scientific topics might be relevant to your teaching context. Okay, thank you. There are a lot of great ideas uh, on our shared Padlet. I think people uh, shared a lot about tools and uh, ways that can do the reflections in the classroom, such as Padlet and the student portfolio. And also, I think some uh, teachers mentioned um, the benefit of doing reflections, such as reflection is also a way to do a self-assessment. Uh, uh, and also um, teachers shared their struggles and uh, their achievements in implementing those uh, strategies in the classrooms. That's, that's awesome. And also we do see some socio-scientific issues that are related to our community uh, and a student interest, like uh, air pollution, environment issues, and also um, technology issues in the modern society. These are great ideas. Thank you very much for sharing. So um, Rachel will talk about assessed learning in the next section. Hi guys. Um, so we wanted to touch a little bit on how you can go about assessing this kind of learning. So there's um, three, uh, steps to this, right? So when thinking about assessment, um, you need to examine what students are learning, how they're learning it, and then think about how they can be assessed. So for these kinds of projects, um, students are learning to use language in uh, context. They have an authentic reason to communicate. So it's not just vocabulary that's embedded in a unit but also the words and concepts that help them to express themselves creatively, explain their thinking and reasoning, connect with their learning with the real world, and question and inquire about ideas that matter to them. They're also learning about digital literacies and multimodal expression, which is the ability to use different digital tools and platforms to integrate media and modes in order to communicate ideas that extend what words themselves can't convey. Things like emotion, emphasis, mood, tone, and humor. Um, they're also learning to use their own voice and choice, um, authentic design of meaning that's personal and individual. And we have a quote that kind of talks about that a little bit. So authentic design of anything, including meaning itself, needs a creative capacity, the ability to fashion the raw material of conventional forms, practices, and meanings into novel ones. And finally, students are learning to collaborate. They're working together to advance their ideas as a collective. Um, and working together as sounding boards and partners in the creation of these multimodal projects. And then students are engaged in learning in a project-based way. So they are investigating and responding to an authentic, engaging, complex question, problem, or challenge. Um, and what's generated is open-ended. So learners um, have personal connections and creativity that are on display. 
And there isn't a concrete answer to the inquiry. So it's the learning process that's that's honored as students communicate ideas creatively in personally meaningful ways. And so as instructors, we provide guidelines for them. We scaffold their choices and guidelines. Um, we sh schedule check-ins or targets for specific pieces or aspects of the project. Um, showcase the products to a wider audience um, and discuss the range of outcomes from these kinds of projects. So now that we've kind of talked a little bit about what students are learning and how they're engaged in learning, we can then take a look at how students can be assessed. And the most common way to create is to create rubrics and performance criteria. So you can see our website materials um, where the assignment sheets contain the rubrics we developed for our projects. Um, and we've learned that the most useful and informative assessments use multiple methods of assessing learning beyond just looking at products and outcome. Um, so these approaches examine different parts of the process and the performance in addition to examining the outcomes. Um, so options for uh, rubrics and performance criteria include both teacher design and teacher and student negotiated. So teaching and learning resolves, revolves around expectations. And in most cases, the teacher decides what is important and valued. But when the teacher together with students decides what's important and valued, assessment can strike that balance between um, making assessment more co-constructive, co-constructed and a more useful form of feedback. Um, and approaches can work together as your instruction progresses throughout the year. So basically working together means that discussions offer a way to work together to discuss sample multimodal products and explain how it would be assessed given the assessment criteria. So there's some options beyond assessing the product and outcomes. There's many ways to think about assessment um, beyond that that allow for formative or useful, helpful guidance to students to help guide their learning um, when it's a process, when we think about this as a process and not just an end product. So we've got storyboards for organizing ideas like the Padlets, um, organize, uh, oral presentations or performances, written or oral reflections, self-assessment checklists, can-do statements, um, and project portfolios. And I'm going to go into all of these now. Um, so you can examine process artifacts along with the products. So on the right here, we have an example of a product, the final product that someone created. But um, in the middle, we have um, an example of students working together, um, creating a process artifact. So examining both of these together to show the steps that students took in their learning process. Um, you can also do oral presentations or performances. So we talked a little bit about this earlier where we had students um, showcase their work um, to uh, the rest of the class. Um, you can even incorporate the written or oral reflections um, as extended responses. Um, so students are able to kind of think about um, the choices that they made and explain why they made them. Um, and we talked, we think you read an excerpt from one of these earlier on. You can also do a self-assessment checklist. So this is where the students are able to kind of reflect back on the work they did. So how well did they work with others? How well did they collaborate, right? Um, how well did they synthesize the use of multiple modes, make use of linguistic resources? So we're not forgetting about language here, um, but we're also considering how well they made use of digital resources and overcome the challenges of multimodal composition. Um, you can also do um, can-do statements. So we have an example here of an actful can-do can statement that, you, that we adapted um, for this context. So um, I can present information on the socio-scientific issue we've learned about and discussed using a variety of linguistic, multimodal, and digital resources. Um, so thinking about things that they are able to do rather than what's present or not present in the project. And finally, um, project portfolios, um, where this is an example um, from another project um, where students are able to create a website where they host um, all of their materials for, the, for all of the projects 
Um, so you can imagine having projects one, two, three, and four processes, uh, products, um, reflections, all hosted on one uh, in one place. Um, so those are all options for assessment, but that doesn't mean um, that you need to choose just one. Like we said, like I said before, um, it's it's most meaningful when um, when multiple are chosen um, to kind of support each other. So um, we've got a couple of activities for you um, to choose from. So um, the first activity is if you want to practice um, assessing a multimodal work. Um, so we have a Padlet for that that's available on the website. And I think Emily just put it in the chat um, where you can evaluate this piece of work. And I put the translation on there for those of you who don't speak French, um, where you can evaluate it based on effectiveness of message, creativity, clear expression of ideas and use of language. Our second option is if you want to design the actual assessment. Um, so you can um, take a look at a lesson plan that we have and decide how you, which of these options, what mix of options you would choose to assess that lesson and why. Um, so we'll give you a few minutes to take, uh, take your pick from those choices and um, work on that. All right, we'll do a little synthesis. Yeah, um, so cool. So keep working away on those padlets if you'd like. Um, but I saw a lot of you were working on uh, choice to uh, picking um, the assessment strategies. So I love it. I see a lot of you were interested in self-assessment, um, but a lot of people are using a mix of things, rubric, but peer assessment, self-assessment, product assessment. It's really, really cool to see all this mix of stuff coming in. Um, uh, and then I see a lot of people are talking about um, uh, the difficulty of assessing um, creativity uh, because it's so subjective. Um, but this is kind of why we suggest negotiating with students about what they value as creativity and why we think um, that it's um, important to include because it is part of multimodal composition. Um, yeah, so I think it is Emily who is going next. All right, I'm going to pass it off to you. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much, Rachel. So we are uh, going to move in just a moment to a brief Q&A session. Um, but before we, we do that, um, as a way to really wrap up our time together, we'd like to uh, take a, a reflective moment um, and ask you to reflect silently and individually uh, on what you've learned from this webinar. Um, and specifically, we'd like you to identify one action item that you'd like to implement in your classroom uh, based on our conversations on our Padlets uh, here today. So give you a, a few minutes for that before we move to some questions to, to wrap us up. And I'll pass it back to Rachel uh, and uh, we will um, all be available for any questions that came up. Awesome. So um, if you have any questions, you're welcome to put them in the Q&A. I did want to go over some of the um, questions that we answered in, um, in the Q&A itself, just um, to make sure we've got everything for the, uh, for the recording um, and to draw your attention to it. Um, so we talked a little bit about uh, creativity um, and assessing that. And I did want to kind of highlight that you can also discuss an example with your students to kind of help anchor um, your expectations um, and showing and not telling what those characteristics look like within literacy practices. Um, we also kind of talked about, uh, Giselle asked, um, what's your rationale for having instructions in English rather than French? Um, so thank you for your question, Giselle. And we wanted everybody to have, have like an easy on-ramp for understanding the assignment um, because there was a lot of cognitive work that went into developing something multimodally. Um, so there was kind of a mix of languages to begin to move students toward using the language in a meaningful way. Um, let's see. Um, we, have an, uh, we have a question about visually disabled learner, learners um, and trying to make uh, multimodal composition 
an inclusive practice. Um, and Blaine answered that by saying um, that one benefit of multimodal projects is that they follow uh, universal design learning principles um, to use whatever modes they need to express themselves. Um, so it works well to provide students choice in the modes that they choose to communicate. Um, uh, Minardi Minardi asked, why do you make a distinction between multimodal um, and digital tools in the rubric? Um, so uh, Jill said that they are very related. So we use multimodal uh, to examine the layers of content and expression to communicate a message. Um, we wanted digital tools as a means of examining the extent to which digital tool helped to facilitate communication of the message. Um, I don't want to spend too much time on these. Do we want to, uh, should I read more of them or should I move to kind of answering more questions live? I think we can move to live if that's okay. And then if anyone else has follow-ups, they can post them in the Q&A for us too. Perfect, okay, all right. So it looks like Barbara has a question. I teach at the college level and we use some creative ways for students to engage in communication that are not the usual essay or straightforward presentation. However, some of my faculty colleagues at the upper levels feel that this is not preparing students to continue with the study of literature and write literature based essays. How do you address this type of prejudice toward multimodal communication? That is a great question. Um, does anybody want to take this one? Okay, um, so that is a very great question, Barbara. Um, and I think that um, buy-in is one of the greatest challenges. Um, I think ideally it would be great if um, kind of that um, multimodal composition could be adapted at uh, later levels to kind of have a, a good balance across the full curriculum. Um, but um, I know that that is not always possible. So kind of creating, um, creating a balance of multimodal communication and literature-based um, options might all, like, like essay-based options might also be an option. Um, what do you guys think? Does anyone else have anything to add there? I think yeah. another, oh, go ahead. <laughs> I was just gonna add a lot of, um, so multimodal projects, I've done like hypertext literary analyses, video analyses, they actually embedded within the process are the types of analytical thinking that you want students to develop. Um, and my research has also found that through the multimodal composing process is a lot of authentic writing that's also happening. So I think you're developing the tools for thinking and academic writing through multimodal projects. Emily? Yeah, just to add to that, I would say, you know, I think, um, I think it can be helpful in to, to share with, with, with colleagues who, who may, uh, who may come from a different perspective, uh, you know, when it comes to multimodality to, to point out the, the sort of, um, the seismic shifts that have been happening in, in terms of, the dominance of print, right? We're, we're moving away from print as being a dominant in, in the way that we communicate. And so pointing out the, the, the shifts in, in the way communication happens uh, in our society more broadly can, can be a way to, to argue for, you know, these are, these are things students are gonna need um, as, as they learn language, as they go out to communicate in, in these different languages, they're gonna need to, to have access to uh, a range of different modes to, to be able to be successful in, in their communicative objectives um, moving forward. Yeah, absolutely. I wanna echo what Blaine and Emily both said. That is um, definitely on point um, what the perspective we're taking here. Um, so we have a question from Roderick. Do you allow translanguaging in multimodal composing projects or does it only defeat the purpose of second language learning? I think I, I, can, I can attempt yeah. um, an answer there. Uh, I personally do. Um, I, I um, am supportive of, of using a range of resources, including the different linguistic resources that students have. Uh, in uh, Tucson, for example, a lot of our students are not L2 learners, they're L3, L4, L5 learners. Uh, and so um, 
sort of making space for them to be able to draw on their entire linguistic repertoire um, is, is something that I personally welcome. Uh, I think that uh, you make a good point about, you know, you know, if, if it's a, my French classroom, for example, of course, I have some objectives around their, their French language learning. And so for me, that's when, you know, you're, you're building um, an activity and a set of assessments that is uh, clearly uh, making space for the French as well. So a portion of their multimodal project, uh, you ask that to be in French, spoken, written, uh, combination, whatever. Um, so that you're kind of making a balance between those, the resources that students have and the ones that you're wanting to see developed. That's my personal approach. Absolutely. I think that also kind of jives with um, our approach to kind of having that mix of languages in the instruction, um, um, kind of allowing for the resources that students have, um, making use of those resources in order to communicate. Any other questions or a uh, response to the question we just had? I'm seeing a lot of people just thanking you all for the wonderful presentation and for the resources that you've shared with us all. Well, thank you. We're, we're so grateful to have had all of you uh, in the audience and thank you for your contributions. And uh, so thank you for attending. And we'd also just, you know, we'd like to say thanks again to Circle for uh, your your immense support for this project. Uh, it's been uh, it's been really wonderful. So thank you. Well, thank all of you. I'm so glad that the website is up and that we've had it to share with all the attendees and I'm grateful for all the participants who've been brainstorming with us and sharing their ideas as well. And those will continue to be there as resources in the padlets that the presenters have created for us. Um, so I know you're all already putting your uh, comments in the chat, but I'm gonna applaud our presenters on behalf of all of us since you're all silent. <laughs> Be the voice of us all. Um, and we hope to see many of you at our next webinar on June 12th. Um, and yeah, continue to look at look to that website for great resources. I know I've been particularly grateful for how the presenters have left us with not only a list of tools, but really, I think, rich and meaningful answers to why we would want to engage in multimodal composing in the language classroom and how to do that and how to assess that in really powerful ways. Um, so thank you all again. We'll make sure that all of your comments uh, get to the presenters as well so they can also see the nice things that you've been saying and the ideas that you've been sharing. And have a great rest of the day, everybody.